Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Congratulations. My name is Dr. Kimberly Lank and I'm a pediatrician at Hogue Medical Group in Huntington Beach. And I'm very excited to talk to you tonight about um, how to raise a healthy infant, what to, know, what to know in the first 12 months. So here's an outline of my presentation. Um, of course, there's a lot to cover. Hang on one second. It's okay. Technical difficulties. So here's an outline of a presentation. Of course, there's going to be a lot of information because I'm covering 12 months of your baby's life. So um, hopefully it's not too overwhelming and bear with me and we will um, have or answer any questions at the end. So make sure to type in any questions that you have along the way and um, at the end I'll answer all of your questions. So during the hospital stay, I'll talk about that, I'll talk about well child care, nutrition, urine and stools, sleep, routine care, safety, vaccines, and development. Okay, so what happens during the hospital stay? So your baby is born. Congratulations, it's a very exciting time. Um, and there's obviously uh, a lot of emotions and it's just an amazing uh, moment for you. Um, what happens right after birth? Uh, you experience a very special time with your baby. It's a, um, called the golden hour. It's that bonding time between mother and baby and partner. And really it's supposed to have very minimal interruption from anyone, um, in including nurses, doctors. No one's really supposed to be in the, um, the room with you or at least um, interrupting you very much. And essentially during that time you have a skin-to-skin uh, -skin moment with the mom and baby where um, that helps with the respiration rate, the heart rate, the temperature of your baby, and it helps mom um, with lactation. And then also within that hour you want to start breastfeeding. So again, it's a very special time. Um, and then after that your baby will receive the hepatitis B vaccine, the vitamin K injection, and erythromycin ointment. And then throughout the hospital stay, um, you will see, be seen by a pediatrician daily, and your baby will be weighed and have uh, vitals taken. You'll have a lot of support, so of course lactation assistance, and that's from uh, either your pediatrician, the nurses, the lactation specialist, and um, there's a few screens that happen uh, before your baby will leave, including the uh, bilirubin screen, cardiac hearing screen, um, and also the newborn metabolic blood work. And of course you'll undergo discharge planning before you leave. And so in terms of discharge planning, um, you're, you're usually seen within the first uh, two days uh, after discharge, so um, usually two to three days depending on what's going on with your baby. Um, and then from there you're seen at two weeks and two months, four, six, nine, and twelve. Um, and then of course anywhere in between, but these are for more w the well visits. And there's a lot that we talk about at the well visits. Uh, we go over nutrition, the urine and stools, growth, sleep, development, safety, physical exams, and of course the immunizations. Okay, so in terms of newborn nutrition, um, I'm sure many of you know uh, breastfeeding is the best and we do uh, recommend uh, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. And there are many, many, many benefits of breastfeeding, but here I've just um, touched on a few. So for the, uh, for the infant, you'll see a decreased incidence of SIDS, diarrhea, lower respiratory tract infections, ear infections, meningitis, botulism, UTIs. Um, it optimizes their development and cognition, and of course it improves bonding with mother. And then for mother, there's a lot of uh, benefits too. Um, and again, these are um, not the uh, complete list, but these are the main um, benefits here. Are uh, an earlier return to pre-pregnancy weight, decreased postpartum bleeding, reduced risk of ovarian cancer, and of again, bonding with your baby. And of course, breastfeeding is economical and readily available. So in, in terms of a few breastfeeding truths, um, this is not always talked about, but breastfeeding is not always easy. So it may take some time to establish good breastfeeding and know that you are not alone and this is like very, very normal. Um, your baby's learning, you're learning. Um, make sure to take advantage of all the help you're gonna have when you're in the hospital and then also outside of the hospital. Your pediatrician's always there for you to support you. Um, you have your nurses while you're in the hospital, lactation specialists. Then also we have the baby line here at Hogue. So make sure to write down this number or take a photo. Um, 
and this will obviously be very readily available wherever you look or if you even want to Google it. Um, and also Hogue is offering now a gift certificate for uh, the Pacify app, um, which is a year's worth of uh, subscription to 24-7 access to a lactation specialist. So that's really excellent. So in terms of breastfeeding, as I already mentioned, you want to initiate this as soon as possible. That will help with um, obviously establishing good breastfeeding and then for a mother to uh, produce breast milk. Um, you want to nurse on demand when there's signs of hunger. So signs of hunger include increased alertness, rooting, mouthing. Um, it's really important to know that crying is a late sign of hunger. So despite what people will tell you, um, you don't want to wait till your baby's fussy. That's a late sign. And that will make it even harder for you to establish a good latch and a good routine if you're waiting until they're crying. So make sure you look for early signs. Um, you want to feed them usually around 8 to 12 times in 24 hours, but um, it could be more. Uh, it just base, it's based off of your baby's cues. So make sure just to pay attention to their cues, and you'll, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. Um, like I said, you learn from each other. And usually it's about 10 to 15 times per breast, and you don't want them to go more than 4 hours in the beginning without feeding. So in terms of uh, breast milk and um, the in the very beginning, you'll have uh, your first few meals of breast milk include, oops, sorry. Um, the first meals will be colostrum, and that is a different um, substance that you, uh, it's not, doesn't look like milk really in the beginning. So it's like a, a kind of a sticky, a yellow substance, um, but it is liquid gold. Uh, it has so much nutrients in there for your baby. It's all your baby needs in the beginning. Um, and it's high in protein and vitamins and the f uh, minerals and immunologic components like antibodies. And it's a little bit lower in the carbohydrates and fats. And then you'll start noticing your milk coming in, and that's usually around day uh, three or five of uh, postpartum. And from there, you'll start noticing that the color will look more like the milk that you're used to, like a creamy color. Um, that's higher in fats and carbohydrates, uh, lower in protein, and it also includes antibodies as well. And at that point, you're going to notice that your breasts start to feel full, so you'll know when your milk's starting to come in. And an important uh, concept is supply and demand. So um, this is not often taught in the very beginning, but um, I want to teach you now so you know. So the more um, you put your baby to your breast, the more uh, you do skin to skin, the more you're going to produce that milk. So um, obviously there are some scenarios you're going to have to, to introduce a bottle um, or formula, and that's totally OK. Um, of course, we try not to do that in the beginning, but sometimes you have to. Um, but if you are doing that, make sure you're keeping up with either um, pumping is usually what you'll need to do if you're doing that instead or more skin to skin. Um, your body won't know that you need that extra breast milk if you're interfering with other um, means of feeding. And often uh, mothers are worried in the beginning that they may not have enough milk. Um, and especially with the colostrum, because it seems like it's so little, um, but like I said, it's liquid gold is very powerful. Um, and your baby's stomach is very, very small in the beginning. So you can see here, the first couple of days of life, the baby uh, stomach is the size of a cherry, and then from there it increases. So walnut size, apricot size. So um, what you're producing is enough, um, and it's important to stay hydrated and try to be, you know, stay relaxed and take care of yourself, and you will produce enough for your baby. So in terms of storing your breast milk, the easiest way is by uh, rule, the rule of fours. So um, four hours at uh, room temperature and four days in the refrigerator. And then from there, you can freeze it in a normal freezer for up to nine months and then in a deep freezer for 12 months. And um, it's important to know that once your milk is thawed, you need to use it within 24 hours. And once uh, your baby takes any taste of that milk, so it, whenever it touches your baby's lips, uh, you need to use it within two hours. And um, as I already mentioned, breastfeeding is the best within the first six months. But of course, if you do want to do formula feeding, um, but you don't need to, nothing else is um, the point of that uh, first bullet. So no, no water, no juices, nothing else. That's what you need in the first six months. Um, and then ideally, if you can continue breastfeeding for the first 12 months, uh, that is the best for your baby. And um, we do start solids around six months usually. We'll talk about that more later. And that's when you can introduce water. 
And again, feeding on demand every two to three hours, no more than four hours in the beginning, uh, 15 minutes per breast, and it comes out to about two to three ounces per feed, but, or about an ounce an hour. And by the end of the first month, you can get up to, you usually get up to around four ounces per feed, and then by six months, it gets to be around six ounces per feed, max seven to eight ounces with four to five feedings per day. And you also want to offer vitamin D supplementation, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, in terms of formula, there's a lot of different formulas out there. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the options, but generally, if you're going to do formula, your pediatrician will usually recommend like an Infamil or a Similac. Those are the formulas that are most similar to breast milk, and they've been studied the most. Um, and there's so many different additives to some of these that you just don't need, and some of them just become very expensive. Um, and the very specialized ones are generally saved for um, certain medical problems. So I would, um, obviously you're gonna be talking to your pediatrician about um, doing any of those specialized formulas. So in terms of vitamin D supplementation, you are gonna wanna supplement your baby with vitamin D if they're exclusively breastfed or even if there's formula fed because you need at least 33 ounces of the formula to get enough vitamin D per day. So I generally recommend vitamin D across the board, um, especially in the beginning. And, um, and for breastfed infants, the exclusively breastfed up to actually we recommend it until 12 months. Um, so it's 400 international units per day and uh, you can get this really anywhere. Um, and these are the ones at the bottom that I usually recommend. But I really like the D drops because it's one drop. You can put on your finger, you can put on your nipple and that's it. So you don't need to do like a larger liquid. Um, and vitamin D is important for tooth formation, bone formation, regulating calcium, and it's generally found in fortified dairy products, fish oils, uh, margarine, egg, egg yolks, and sunlight, and these are all the things that your baby will not be getting in the first uh, 12 months of life, so that's why I do recommend it, and that's why um, the AEP recommends it, and almost every pediatrician I know, of course, will recommend it. And so for spit up, so um, this is something that it's important that to know that every baby has some level of reflux. So almost every baby will um, spit up in some way or have reflux going on. Um, and that's mainly because the flap over the stomach is not strong enough. And so it, you have this reflux happening. Um, sometimes it comes out, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's usually not a concern. Um, this is different from vomiting, for sure, um, and it rarely causes any weight loss, discomfort, or choking, and vomiting is very different. You'll, um, you'll know the difference eventually, but like when you obviously see it in your baby, but it's more forceful, um, and it causes discomfort. Spit-ups usually kind of dribble out of the side, and it's, uh, it looks, it may be concerning because it may be a lot, but um, usually it shouldn't cause any problem at all. Um, and ways to help this uh, include you want to decrease any interruptions, sudden noises or bright lights when you're feeding because any startling that might cause more reflux. You want to burp often, so usually after you feed, getting a good burp in, that's um, sufficient. Um, but if you're starting to notice more uh, spit ups, then you might want to burp in between breasts um, or even every three to five minutes. And then also holding your baby upright for 20 to 30 minutes after feeding, which is actually a very long time. Um, that's really good for reflux prevention too. And um, if all these things aren't working, you're probably gonna be talking to your pediatrician anyways, but um, smaller, more frequent feeds are recommended. So in terms of solids, um, as I've already talked about, I, we usually don't recommend solids until six months, um, but anywhere from four to six months could be okay, but six months is really ideal um, because you wanna wait till they are developmentally ready. So in terms of that, you wanna look for good head control, good chunk control, sitting up, and an interest in solid foods. Um, and if they're not showing you these things, then you don't really wanna start yet. Um, and that's usually around six months is when they are developmentally ready. And also introducing too early can lead to things like iron deficiency, anemia, obesity. So we usually always rec recommend around six months. Um, if they initially refuse solid foods, don't force it. Don't get worried. Just try again in a week or two. Um, of course, if you're uh, nervous about it or if they're never you know, accepting the solids, then you might want to talk to your pediatrician. But usually um, they come around to it. In the beginning, it's very much a they're practicing um, you might just see them kind of you know push it out and they're not really swallowing it sometimes they might just push it and then eventually will swallow it um, it just takes time and they've been used to one thing their whole life up until that point so um, 
so again, just try it again in a couple weeks if your baby's not um, really happy about it. And, um, and it's important to know that in the first 12 months, um, sorry, yeah, first 12 months, the main source of your baby's uh, calories should come from the breast milk or the formula. So even when you introduce solids, the, the bulk of the calories should be from your breast milk or formula, and then you transition around 12 months. So the solids are really uh, more of a practice in the beginning. And so for solids, you want to introduce a variety of foods, um, especially the allergenic foods. So uh, your shellfish, your nuts, uh, peanuts, uh, eggs, those are very important to do in the very beginning. All of the studies are showing that that's a lot more beneficial and decrease the rate of uh, food allergies. And, um, and then also it's important to know if your baby doesn't like some of these things um, or doesn't like a specific type of solid, it doesn't actually mean they don't like it. They, you have to try at least 15 times to determine if they're going to like it or not. Um, and then you also want to make sure you avoid any sort of choking hazard, of course, so grapes, hard round foods, hot dogs. Um, nuts are listed there, but if you give it to them in a way that they can handle it, so you blend it up, puree it up, um, and that could be okay. And the, the real rules of um, six to 12 months, though, the other besides the choking hazards is you really don't, we do not recommend any honey until 12 months and up, and also cow's milk. Um, and that's mainly cow's milk that's replacing um, any of your uh, breast milk or formula. You can give dairy products, so cheeses, things like that, yogurts, but you don't want that to be replacing um, the, the breast milk or the formula that they're getting. And so as I mentioned earlier, you can introduce wa uh, water once you start solid foods, but you don't want to do any juice usually. Um, we usually don't recommend juice in general, but, um, but less than one year of age, for sure, we don't recommend that. Um, it doesn't really give you any sort of nutritional benefit, and it can also cause loose stools. And around eight months, they do, your baby starts to learn how to finger, uh, or they want to eat, uh, so offer finger foods. They start trying to feed themselves. So um, th at that point, they should be really sitting independently and uh, offer them a spoon too. Um, so some of the finger foods include steamed veggies, bananas, well-cooked pasta, small pieces of bread, things like that, scrambled eggs. Um, and then by nine months, you want to transition to three meals and two snacks. Okay, and then around 12 months, as I mentioned, that's when you switch. So the diet at that point should consist of uh, mostly solid foods, and now the you start uh, whole milk, cow's milk, and um, that's a supplement. So 16 to 12, 24 ounces per day at that point, and you also want to wean off the bottle. Okay, so now we're going to talk about elimination. So this is going back to the beginning. So in terms of urine and, and uh, your baby, they need to have essentially a urine per day of life. So day of life one, one urine, day of life two, two urines, and so forth, up until day five, and then it's around five to eight. And for stools, this is much different. So the amount of stools can range a lot. Um, during the first few days, you'll notice that the stool is going to be a thick meconium that's black um, and it's sticky. And um, that later transitions to more of a brown, yeller, yeller, yellow, looser stool um, with like a little seedy uh, ness to it, especially if you're breastfeeding. And um, as I mentioned, there's a large range of how many stools babies have per day. Um, some babies have multiple per day, some with every feed, and some have less than one per day. And that's actually totally fine. They can skip days and not have a poop as long as everything else is fine. They're gaining weight, they're eating fine, they're not vomiting, things like that. Um, the problems that we do have though with stools, or the things that we do want to know about um, are hard pebbly stools. We don't like white stools, black stools, or red stools. So if any of those things are happening, definitely let your pediatrician should know. Okay, so for sleep. So the, your newborn is gonna sleep a lot in terms of um, the hours per day. So 16 to 20 or 18 hours per day is the amount of um, sleep your baby's gonna be in, so it's a lot. Um, and they generally do wake though every two to three hours to feed. And they're usually more active at night than during the day. And that transitions around two months where um, they start becoming more alert and awake during the day. So that's a, a fun milestone to look forward to. Um, we don't expect any more than um, the six hours straight though until four months. So you, they're ge generally not developmentally ready to sleep more than six hours straight at that time. 
Um, so that's also why we don't recommend any sort of sleep training before four months of age. Um, they really can't self-soothe very well until then. Um, so it's, it's we, as pediatricians, we usually um, don't recommend doing any sort of sleep training until then. And then by four to six months, they usually have about three naps per day, and then six to 12 months, two to three naps per day, about uh, six to 10 hour stretches at night. So that's exciting. And so for sleep, you do want to start doing a um, consistent bedtime routine when it makes sense for you. Um, so this is not really sleep training. It's more of just developing good habits, um, giving your baby a warm bath or rocking, reading, so they kind of know it's time uh, for bed. And um, you want to put them in their crib before they actually fall asleep. So you don't want to wait until they are asleep in your arms and then put them in. You want to transition them in when they're drowsy. Um, if you don't do that, they, they can wake up and they get startled that they're no longer in your arms. So this is the best way to go about it. And then for safe sleep, this is very important. So um, you want to always, always put your baby on their back and they need to be in a crib or a bassinet and in parents' room until 12 months is the safest. You want to use um, a bassinet or crib that has a firm mattress with a fitted sheet and you want nothing else in there. No, no pillows, no bumpers, no toys, no blankets, nothing else. Um, and you want to make sure that the temperature in their room is comfortable and you don't want to overdress them or overwrap them and you want to make sure no one smokes around the baby and all these things help to decrease the risk of SIDS. And then in terms of routine care, so you want to keep the, um, your, your baby's umbilical cord, uh, you want to keep that dry. And so you basically don't want to touch it, really. Um, you want to keep the diaper below it. You don't want to do any sort of submersion baths, um, but you can do some sponge baths. And then the uh, stump usually falls off around one week of life. The things to look for are um, foul smells, redness, or a lot of large uh, uh, discharge. Those are things you definitely want to tell your pediatrician about. And then, as I mentioned, you want to do sponge baths until that stump falls off. And also, if your baby's a boy, if you had a circumcision, you want to wait um, to do a full submersion bath until that circumcision is healed as well. And I, we always recommend usually um, bathing with fragrance-free soaps. Um, it's okay to use fragrance-free lotions as well, like uh, Vaseline if needed, but it's not always needed. Um, you want to avoid direct sunlight. We don't recommend any sunscreen until six months of life, but of course, if you are in a scenario for some reason that you can't avoid direct sunlight, then that's something that you could potentially do, but I would talk to your pediatrician first about uh, what they would recommend. Um, usually around six months is when sunscreen is most uh, safe for your baby. And of course, right now it's you know obviously different, but in general, we always avoid avoiding uh, or recommend avoiding sick people and crowded public places, um, but I know we're not doing that right now anyways. Um, and in terms of dressing your baby, as I mentioned in the slide before, whatever you're comfortable in, the, your baby should be two, plus one, one more layer, like their swaddle. That should be fine. Um, you want to call your pediatrician if there's any fever, so a fever is greater than 100.4, and um, of course any poor feeding, change in wet diapers, or any concerns that you have. So for safety, so more safety elements. Um, you want your baby to be in a car seat in the in the back of your car, um, in the back seat, rear facing, and again, smoke free environment. And you want to avoid drinking any hot liquids around your baby while you're holding them. And you want to set your uh, home water temperature to be less than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to keep your baby or your hand on your baby while you're changing them, and keep any bracelets, strings, or cords away from them. Uh, you don't want to leave them alone in the tub, of course. And the concept of cocooning, so you want your um, infant to be, well, when you can see more people, um, you do want your infant to be surrounded by those that are um, vaccinated. So um, again, once things you know change or um, once you're seeing uh, more people or visiting, um, you want people, caregivers and visitors to be up to date on Tdap, especially in flu, and we'll talk about the Tdap a little bit later. So for child proofing, you want to start working on these things um, just to get things uh, ready. You want to keep heavy objects hot and hot liquids off the tablecloths. You want to um, look f into getting a gate for stairs if you have stairs. Uh, you need barriers around space heaters and locks on windows or guards. Street screens do not count for this. That's not a guard. So you need to have uh, a, a lock or some other uh, safety mechanism for your, your window. 
um, keep cords out of reach and you want to keep your baby in arm's reach whenever you're near water. Um, and then you want to store clean or the cleaning products, medication, anything that's unsafe, you want to be um, high and out of reach. And poison control, it's re really important to have this number, so I would save this number, put it in your phone right now, um, so you have it just in case. Okay, so for immunizations. So at Hogue Medical Group and pediatricians generally across the board, we definitely recommend vaccines. It's a very important part of your child's health um, and safety. They are safe and they're effective. And here's a general overview of what to expect uh, during the 12, first 12 months in terms of vaccines. So um, it may seem like a lot, but it's really not too much. A lot of them are combined and they're uh, very safe and as I said, effective um, and they're definitely recommended. Um, and then you'll see at six months, we do recommend the flu vaccine and that's a very exciting time. It was for me when, um, when my baby was, was able to receive the flu vaccine. And so I'm gonna go th into a couple of these vaccines that you may not be as uh, clear about. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the DTaP vaccine or Tdap, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is the vaccine that we, um, that is to protect you against the P part is the important part for the, um, well, it's all important, but the P is the pertussis, the whooping cough, and that's a highly contagious respiratory disease. And that's caused by bacteria. It can be fatal in infants less than one year and infants are often affected or infected by their caregivers and uh, by other children around them, older children, and because the um, whooping cough can actually present in, in um, older uh, individuals as just a, a respiratory or a uri, like a URI or cold. So it may not be as obvious that they have the whooping cough. Um, so infants will generally develop symptoms about five to 10 days after exposure. Um, and so you want to make sure, as I have already mentioned, that the caregivers or visitors are up to date on their vaccines, including the Tdap vaccine. So in, in terms of symptoms, this causes violent coughing, difficulty breathing, apnea, which is basically your baby stops breathing. Um, and this usually happens in infants. And complications include hospitalization, apnea, and um, there, are, there are deaths, of course, from this illness. So outbreaks, so in 2012, the U.S. saw uh, about 50,000 cases of pertussis with 16 infant deaths. And in 2019, the U.S. reported 15,000 cases and three infant deaths. And most infants, or many infants, are hospitalized with this infection. And the peak incidence occurs every about three to five years or so. And prevention, again, Tdap vaccine. Um, pregnant women will receive the Tdap booster during their uh, each pregnancy around the 27th to 36th week and um, all adult caregivers should look into getting the Tdap booster. It's generally very easy to obtain. And you wanna make sure your other, other children are up to date and that your infant can receive the vaccine as early as six weeks. So here's some other important information and um, just some um, pictures that show uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine and also uh, that this, that whooping cough or pertussis is really um, very prevalent in uh, infants. So you can see that the, um, the yellow or on the, my left side, um, the, the uh, graph that shows the pink line at the top, that shows how um, prevalent it is in uh, infants. And then you'll see at the next uh, graph, you'll see the yellow line that shows how effective the vaccine is at, at decreasing the amount of cases of pertussis. And then the bottom uh, table just again stresses that um, this generally occurs, um, really affects infants and um, can lead to some devastating consequences. So the next vaccine or um, uh, infection I'm gonna talk about is uh, the caused by the bacteria Haemophilus influenza, Hib. Um, this is a bacteria that causes severe infections in children under five. Um, it can cause pneumonia, meningitis, epiglottitis, which is an infection of the throat, and it causes very difficult deep breathing. Uh, bloodstream infections, ear infections. So three to six percent of infants with Hib meningitis die, and 20 percent who survive have permanent hearing loss or other neurologic problems. And the United States started using the Hib vaccine for children um, in 1987 and for infants in 1990. And then we saw the annual incidence of invasive Hib decrease by 99% with this vaccine. 
So before the vaccine, there were about 20,000 cases per year with 1,000 deaths in children under five. And then by 2007, the incidence of invasive Hib um, disease in children was uh, around 0.18 cases per 100,000. Um, and generally, the cases occurred in children that were either too young to receive the vaccine or uh, children that weren't immunized. So strep pneumo, that's another um, cause of severe bacterial pneumonia, can also cause meningitis, ear infections, sinus infections, bloodstream infections. Uh, the higher risks are, um, higher risk children are less than two years old and those that attend daycare or group childcare. Um, so one in 10 children under five with pneumococcal meningitis die, others have hearing loss, developmental delays. So again, it's vaccine preventable with uh, Prevnar 13. And since the vaccination was introduced, the rates decreased by 99%. So here's another graph just depicting the effectiveness of the vaccine. You can just see how the rates just plummet um, after the vaccine has been introduced. Okay, okay so development. So in terms of some milestones that us pediatricians look for, um, in the first month, you'll see that your baby will recognize parents' voice. They lift their head when they're on their tummy. They follow their parents with their eyes. And around two months, they start smiling, they start cooing. They have better head control at that time. You'll start seeing, well, they should always be moving their arms and legs symmetrically. Um, and then they also start to self-soothe at that time, but they don't really achieve that until around four months. Um, so four months, they elicit, they elicit social interactions. They start babbling, expressively laughing. They can push so on their chest and elbows. They have good head control, and they begin to, um, to roll and reach for objects. And again, they can self-soothe at that time. And six months, they become more socially interactive with parents. They recognize, they recognize familiar faces. They definitely roll very well by that point. They sit with support. They explore their environment by putting everything in their mouth. Um, and they stand with assistance. They like to bounce. And at nine months, you start seeing the stranger anxiety. They start to seek out their parent. They use repetitive sounds. And they point out objects, learn interactive games, explore their environment. They should be crawling by that point. They pull the stand, they cruise, um, they say mom and data, but it's not specific, so it's just mom and data, um, and they wave bye-bye. And at 12 months, you start seeing that they imitate your activity, they form a very strong attachment with their parent, they speak one to two words, and that's specifically mom and data. Um, they can stand and take a few steps on their own, usually about one to two, and they can follow simple directions. So tummy time. Tummy time is very, very important. It really helps with um, a lot of things. So the gross motor skills, it helps with increasing the neck, back, and arm muscle strength, and it improves head control, and this decreases the risk of SIDS, and it also helps with head shape. And you want to start this once the umbilical stump has fallen off so that you don't irritate the skin around it. And you want to perform it, try to perform either before feeding or 30 minutes after feeding um, while awake on a safe, firm surface under supervision. So this is hard to um, fit in, especially in the beginning, because if you're trying to do it either before feed, they're usually, you know, they're hungry. Um, and then performing after about 30 to 40 minutes after, because, well, um, 30 minutes or so after because you don't want them to spit up. So you're, you're going to find that it's kind of difficult to fit in, but just try any time that you can and whenever it seems right, fit it in. It's better to get small little bursts of this throughout the day than to have one long um, tummy time um, period or um, experience. Um, and the goal is to eventually though, so you'll start noticing it gets, it'll get easier and easier to fit it in. Um, it's eventually you want to have your baby to be um, in tummy time about 50% of their awake time in tummy time. So that's a lot of time. Okay, and then in terms of infant needs uh, for development, they, they uh, need to feel loved and special and valued and safe. They want to feel confident about what to expect from their environment. They, um, you want to expose them, though, to um, different languages, play, exploration, books, music, and toys. And during the first three years of your life, or their life, their brain has the greatest potential for learning. 
And then the first one to three months, you want to provide a consistent, warm environment with uh, physical contact and a lot of talking, reading, singing. You want to address them by their name. You want to be able to, you want to read their cues, know when they're happy versus upset, and you want to respond to those cues. You can't spoil a baby in the, in the first three months of their life. And um, you want to provide colorful objects of different sizes, shapes, and textures. So from four to seven months, you want to provide a safe environment. So that's when your baby's going to start doing a little bit more to explore and roam freely. You want to talk to them again, read, sing. You um, want to have your baby might imitate your set their uh, imitate sounds, and it's fun to imitate it back to them as well. Um, you want to read every day and show interest in the sounds that they're making, engage in rhythmic movement, dancing. Um, eventually introducing them to other children and parents and you want to avoid any stressful or traumatic experience. And so from 8 to 12 months, you want to encourage play with blocks and soft toys. You want to play games like pat a cake and peekaboo and you want to teach them to say bye bye, shake their head yes or no, and you want to spend lots and lots of time on the floor. And that is about it. I know it was a lot of information. Thank you so much for listening. And now, we have, hmm? we, have we have questions. Okay, so I'll be answering any questions now that, as they come my way. Okay, so first one, other than breastfeeding, what are the main best preventions of SIDS? So that's the slide that I um, talked about. So I can probably scroll back, but I also know the answer off the top of my head, of course. But let me get to the slide so that uh, you can have it in front of you. Okay, so, um, so for SIDS, so you want to put your, the baby on their back. You want to have a firm uh, mattress with a fitted sheet. You want nothing else in the crib at all. So uh, no bumpers, no uh, stuffed animals, no extra blankets. You don't want any extra blankets, uh, no toys. And um, keeping them in your room with you up until six months is the minimum. But if you can, 12 months is really ideal. And then a smoke for your environment, of course. You want to make the temperature comfortable. Um, don't overdress them. And um, those are really the, the key elements to, to preventing SIDS and breastfeeding, <laughs> as you mentioned. Okay. Next one is how long do you feed a baby for? So when they're, um, so, okay, so for breastfeeding. So um, about 15 minutes per breast is what you usually aim for, 10 to 15 minutes per breast. Okay. How do you know when you have fed the baby enough? How do you know when they're full that you overfeed? Okay, so, hmm? Oh, repeating the question, yes. Sorry. Um, so how do you know when your baby's full and can you overfeed your baby and how do you know that they're getting enough? Um, that's like a multiple part uh, question. Um, so they'll, they'll pull away generally when they're full um, and they'll be satisfied. So they won't be uh, looking for it anymore and um, they, they'll go to sleep or they'll, they'll seem a lot more comfortable. Um, they can be overfed though, so um, if you overdo it in terms of uh, if, if you feed every time that they stir or get upset, um, you can overfeed, uh, which is actually surprising for a lot of people. So make sure you go through, um, kind of like I said in the, very be in the beginning, you want, there's um, a lot of different things that can cause crying. Um, so they might need to be talked to, sang to, moved, picked up, walked around, burped, changed. It's not always feeding, um, but there is what's uh, called cluster feeding sometimes at the beginning where if they're showing you all the signs, like the rooting, the mouthing, like like sticking their tongue out, then then they probably are hungry and they can't. They, you can feed sometimes every hour and it could be totally normal. Um, I think I answered all the questions there, I think. Thoughts on ready to go formulas, which formula is best? Okay, so that's another, well, Infamil, Similac are the ones that we usually recommend. Um, the, the one that's pre-made is very convenient, but I find that economically, the powdered ones in the, the uh, can, um, you'll get more out of it. Um, so we usually recommend Infamil or Similac just because those are uh, studied the most, um, and they're most similar to breast milk, and those are very easy to find anywhere. Do we need to add vitamin D starting day one? So, by and large, 99% of the people that we have come into our offices, they don't have vitamin D started yet. But we don't see your baby until um, day like two or three, and it's totally fine if you hadn't started it yet. We 
I know at Hogue Medical Group, we often have some um, samples that we give out at that point, and parents are very grateful about that. Um, some parents do have, they have already bought it, and that's great too. Um, but it's okay to um, not start at day one if you know you're taking everything else in and you're kind of just getting in, uh, the swing of things. Um, but your pediatrician will talk about it when they see you for the first time. How much oh. is the ideal room temperature for baby? What is the appropriate temperature in the car? Okay, so um, in terms of, oh yeah, repeating the questions, I'm sorry. So um, ideal temperature um, for your baby is around 70 degrees when they're sleeping, sometimes 68, 69, around that. Um, basically what you're comfortable in. And same with the car, you don't wanna you know, blast the um, air too much. You don't wanna have the heat um, going like crazy unless you, know, you just wanna, if you're comfortable, your baby's comfortable. Um, obviously never leave them in the car on their own. Um, and, and then usually in terms of um, being in the car, we do recommend, especially in the beginning, um, if you're going for long drives, to take a lot of breaks. Okay. Can we wrap the baby in fleece blanket at night? So you don't have to, it's especially here or um, in most places, as long as you keep the uh, temperature in your room in there. Oh, I didn't repeat the question. Can you wrap your baby in a fleece blanket at night? I'm sorry. Um, and so generally you don't have to, to wrap your baby in a fleece blanket at night, um, as long as the, the room is comfortable. Uh, whatever you're comfortable in, your baby should be comfortable in. So they can wear a onesie and just one wrap or one swaddle, and that is totally fine. And around two months, I don't think I mentioned this, but two months is when I recommend stopping the swaddle because um, you can have a range of time where they start to, to roll. And so around two months they might start to roll, so we usually discontinue the swaddle around that time. Is this new bassinet safe, comfortable for newborns? Is it the best to prevent SIDS and promote good sleep? So the question is about the SNU. Um, so this, there's a lot of um, debate on that and there's a lot of different re opinions in terms of pediatricians and what they recommend for um, the SNU. Some love it and some really don't like it. Um, for me personally, I know that the SNU can offer a lot of benefits, but they're strapped down usually in that, and I don't personally feel comfortable with that, knowing that weird things happen, and if your baby flips over somehow, they really, really cannot get back. So, um, but again, there's a huge range of opinions on the snoo. Okay. If babies spit up, should you feed them more milk to replace the amount that was spit up? So the question is, if your baby spits up, should you replace the amount of milk that they've spit up? Um, usually, no. Um, often, spit, spit ups can can be a sign too of overfeeding. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. So, no. And it's hard to know how much they've actually spit up too. If they seem hungry, then you know if they're still showing you cues or mouthing, they're rooting. Then you can try to uh, continue feeding, but. Um, Usually, you don't have to think about replacing that food and um, giving back. How do you feel about head shaping pillows when baby is sleeping? No, sorry. The question is, <laughs> the question is, how do you feel about head shaping pillows? Absolutely not. Um, no pillows at all in the the crib or the bassinet. At what age can we introduce a security blanket with a little stuffed animal attached? So the question is, what age can we uh, introduce a stuffed animal? slash blanket, and that is after 12 months. What are the vaccinations they receive at the hospital? Again, and which vaccines are given while pregnant, pregnant that pass through to baby? So the question is, which vaccines are given at the hospital and which ones are given to pregnant women? Um, so the baby will receive the hepatitis B vaccine um, and then you'll, during pregnancy, you'll receive the Tdap and the flu vaccine. At what age is it safe for babies to meet new people? So the question is, at what age are babies, or is it safe to introduce your babies to new people? Um, so right now it's obviously a very um, different time, so I would have a different answer usually about, with this. But um, by and large, 30 days at home is really recommended in terms of the first month is uh, you want to try to limit exposure as much as you can. Um, and obviously, especially right now, I would not recommend any visitors right now. Um, but 
you know, obviously you have grandparents and things like that that are going to want to um, visit and see your child. So um, the 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 less amount of interaction, the better right now. Um, but for sure, in the thirty the first thirty days, that's when your baby is most at risk for infections that can spread to their brain. Um, so that's the time that you really want to be really strict. And then um, and then the first two months, there obviously are still risk factors, but there's a lot of benefits to to introducing um, your child to uh, other people. But it's right now it's hard to really answer that question too because it's different. So um, just be careful with your uh, visitors, and um, you want to limit any um, any visit, visiting right now, especially with the restrictions and guidelines. Are pacifiers helpful? If so, when should they be introduced? So uh, the question is, are pacifiers helpful? And if so, when should they be introduced? I'm going to take a little sip of water real quick. So I really like pacifiers, but um, you want to wait until good breastfeeding has been established, and that's usually around two weeks, um, and then you can start using the pacifier. So as long as you really have a good rhythm going with your baby, you're doing um, your breastfeeding really well, um, then you can introduce the pacifier, and um, that actually, it's another thing that helps to decrease the risk of SIDS, so I'm a fan of them. What temperature should you bath a baby at? So you want to make sure that you're, the, oh, the question is, um, what temperature should you be bathing your baby at? So again, a, a comfortable um, temperature. So you want to put your hand in the water. Um, I generally recommend that rather than relying on um, any thermometers or things like that. As long as it is a comfortable temperature for you, not too hot, not too cold, um, that will be the temperature that you're going to want to bathe your baby in. How soon can you take your baby for a stroller walk? So the question is, how soon can you take your baby uh, for a stroller walk? Um, so again, right now, um, it's a little stricter in terms of uh, the recommendations for that. But um, walks are good, getting out, getting some fresh air, moving around, especially for mom, too. So you can do it pretty early, but you want to just try to do it at times that you may not have much interaction um, with people. But you, um, I always do recommend, especially in the beginning, to to cover your baby um, for sure because of the first for one thing the sunlight and you'll be surprised um, even right now how people will reach in and touch your baby um, I have a eight month old and I just was on a walk the other day and someone reached in and just grabbed him and you know so these things happen um, I also had someone um, even when my baby was covered in the car seat um, they pulled down the cover and looked in and tried to throw in a toy. So, <laughs> so things happen. Um, so, but usually if you have the cover around, um, that's kind of a sign for people to, to, you know, to maybe not touch them. But um, right now, again, go at times, maybe that you won't run into that many people. Like, it is good for you to walk, um, good to get some fresh air. And, um, and of course, you don't want to get your baby in direct sunlight for more than 15 minutes at a time or even at all if you can avoid it. Also, what angle are they supposed to lay in their stroller? The question is, what angle are they supposed to lay in their stroller? So it depends on what kind of stroller you have. Um, a lot of people end up having the car seat that clicks into the stroller, and it's the incline. It's hard to say, like the actual degree, but um, you don't want them to be too um, vertical because then their head will fall down. So and that will cut off the airway. So you want it to be at a kind of like a angle like this to where they're comfortable, they're laying back, they're not going to have their head uh, fall forward and they uh, collapse the, or they block their airway. Can we let our baby sleep with us on bed? So the question is, can we have our baby sleep with, sleep with, us, sleep with us in the bed? Um, pediatricians do not recommend co-sleeping. It's dangerous. Um, so that's something that you'll probably see across the board that will say, no, it's not recommended and it can increase suffocation and SIDS as well. Should we ever sleep baby on the side to avoid issues with possible throwing up while sleeping? So the question is, should we place our baby on their side to avoid throwing up? And the, question, the answer is also no. Um, still always recommend put your baby on their back. Um, Parents do worry that they're going to spit up and choke, but that hardly ever, ever happens. It's very, 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 very rare. The amount of um, babies that have SIDS is higher than that. So the risks of putting them on their 
uh, side is a lot higher than putting them on their back. Um, so always, always back. When is safe for air travel? So the question is, when is it safe for air travel? So that's um, a, of course, not right now, um, but when things change, um, I always recommend waiting the longer the better. Um, it, it depends on also the season that you're traveling. Um, winter time is not a good time. Um, you're stuck in uh, air with a bunch of people and a lot of different germs, as, as you all know. Um, you want to try to wait until at least the first set of vaccines. Um, ideally, as m the more vaccines, the better, especially if you can get the flu vaccine. Um, that is the safest. Um, but I know life happens. Um, sometimes you absolutely have to travel. And um, so I would just discuss it with your pediatrician first um, to see if it's safe at the time that you decide to go. Is germ-free um, humidifier safe to use or recommended for newborns? So the question is, are humidifiers safe to use or they, are they recommended? Um, we do recommend them for certain scenarios. So if your baby is congested, um, so that's something that you can uh, um, have in the room. You don't have to have it though. It's not something that we would um, recommend outside of um, congestion. Like you don't want to, you don't have to use it for prevention, um, but it's definitely, definitely safe. At what age do you recommend we start child proving baby gates, et cetera? Okay, so the question is, at what age do you recommend starting to child-proof? So um, as a mother um, and pediatrician, uh, my baby is eight months, and um, the sooner the better, of course, but there's a lot going on in the beginning to where you are going through a big life change, and it's amazing, um, but some of those things can obviously wait, so um, just try to tackle one thing at a time. But for sure, once your baby starts any, showing any signs of mobility, um, you definitely want to have um, avoided waiting too long. So you don't want to wait until they're crawling to start childproofing. So um, and rolling too, they get around a lot actually when they roll. Um, so uh, rolling can happen anywhere from three months, maybe even sometimes two, it's, it's pretty early. Um, but usually it's around four to six months. So um, you want to start trying to child-proof around that time or a little bit before if you can. Is pest control safe before baby arrives to avoid any flea, insect, et cetera? The question is, is pest control uh, safe to do to prevent any sort of like fleas and ticks and etc. So um, I guess it depends on what type or um, what they're going to do. I know that there was a moment where um, I needed to get a, um, I wanted to get my house fumigated um, because there was ants, um, but all of the um, the companies recommended leaving the house for um, like an extended period of time um, and also emptying out all of your uh, cabinets and uh, kitchen and closets and so it just it seemed like a very um, big task and so I never did it um, but I would just talk to the, um, the company that's doing it and uh, make sure it's safe but they usually ma make you leave the house for uh, quite a while um, obviously if you do it before they're born it should be fine given the current pandemic under what circumstances would you allow baby to meet grandparents, attend daycare, go to stroller walks, etc.? What are the new updated recommendations? So the question is, hang on, sorry. So um, the question is about COVID and the new, um, any new recommendations in terms of exposing uh, your baby to um, other people and uh, grandparents, daycares. So as I've already kind of mentioned that in the first um, few months of life, that already is a precious time and a time that um, they are susceptible to a lot of infections. Um, right now, it's not recommended, obviously, to have, um, you, they recommend staying at home, staying separate. Um, and uh, daycares are opening up um, in a couple weeks for a lot of places. Um, but I wouldn't start, obviously, daycare um, until, uh, Obviously, out of the, you're going to be at home anyways, so um, waiting until you go back to work and start a daycare. Um, ideally, once you have your first set of uh, vaccines, is safest. Uh, obviously, COVID's different. We don't have those things. Um, and it's really hard to give really clear guidelines for that right now, too, just because it's changing every day. Um, right now, the nice part is that um, 
by and large, uh, children are not as affected, but infants don't have as strong of an immune system and they can have devastating uh, consequences from an infection in general. Any infection can be really bad for an infant. So um, try your best to, to just stay secluded um, as long as, you know, those are the guidelines recommended for, um, uh, obviously right now that's how it is, rec or that is recommended. Um, and um, you want to protect your, you know, the grandparents too. So you're obviously going to be in the hospital when you have them. So that's going to be an exposure. So there's to so many layers to it. Um, it's a hard time right now, but uh, just you know, try to if you try your best to um, be patient and enjoy um, the process. And it changes every day. So it's also, um, like I said, it's hard for me to really know what's going to happen in the next few weeks. But right now, just um, plan on um, having very limited exposure. What are your thoughts on having baby's bassinet near a wall unit air conditioner? So the question is, what are your thoughts on having a bassinet or crib near a like an uh, vent, uh, air conditioning? Mm -hmm. um, so you just want to make sure that they're comfortable in where they're at. So. Um, before your baby comes, if you want to kind of sit in that area and see how it feels, but it's good to have a thermometer or um, uh, gauge on what uh, the temperature is in the room, but you don't need necessarily, um, you definitely don't need um, anything blowing right directly at your child. Um, again, whatever you're comfortable with is what they should be comfortable with. Um, in Huntington Beach, um, often there is not um, a lot of houses don't have AC, and that's what I have. I don't have AC in my home. Um, so if your baby is born in the summertime, you are worried about the, the, um, their room being too warm, but they will be next to you. So that's another thing too. They're gonna be, you're gonna be in a room with the bassinet nearby. And so you're gonna know if you're not comfortable, if you're warm, you may have to put in some fans to, to um, d bring down the, the temperature. Are essential oils safe to use for pregnant women and babies? So the question is, are essential oils uh, safe to use in pregnant women or, and or in babies? Um, I would ask your OBGYN about that in terms of uh, for pregnant women. Um, for babies, we don't recommend it. Um, again, in the first six months, they can absorb a lot through their skin. They, their skin really absorbs a lot. So we don't recommend anything like that. Can you recommend any guidelines for interactions between pets, cats, dogs, um, and newborns? So the question is, can you offer any advice on interaction with pets? Um, as someone who has two pets at home, I have two basset hounds, so um, I know how important they are to uh, your family and they are like a member of your family. Um, so in general, um, you want to make sure that you're always around, of course, when you have um, the animal in the area um, with your newborn. Um, however, if that animal had any signs earlier on of aggression, then, you know, um, that's a common sense that you may not want to have that uh, interaction. But um, you always want to be around with an arm's distance, um, making sure that, uh, you know, when your baby starts grabbing for things, um, showing interest in your pet, um, you want to be right there. Um, even pets that show no signs of um, snapping or aggression can sometimes react that way if their ears are being pulled or their eyes are being poked. So you won't always be there. Um, and make sure that your animal is also um, following gui vet guidelines. You want to make sure that your animal is up to date on their vaccines, that they're healthy. Um, that's always important too. Um, and, then, and then obviously you want them to just be uh, taken care of. And, and oh, and I was going to say another thing, some things you can try are um, before uh, you introduce the, um, the dog, the cat, um, mainly with dogs is what I mean, I know more because that's um, my, but we have dogs, but um, bringing home like a, a, a blanket or a onesie that your baby has already been in or a hat and having them smell that prior to uh, meeting them, sometimes that eases the transition too. Um, so those are kind of the main things that I would recommend. Okay, last question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the baby wise sleeping method? 
So the question is, what are my thoughts on the baby wise sleeping method? Um, so we do like baby wise, um, but I, again, I don't recommend any sort of um, sleep training until four months. And then from that point on, um, once you start, you know, if you start doing a schedule or training, by and large, the most important thing is that you're consistent. So whatever method you choose, there's a lot of methods out there, um, but just be consistent with whatever you do and you'll see results. Oh, that was the last question. So um, anyways, uh, thank you so much again for uh, joining me tonight. I hope you learned something and, um, and I hope you all stay safe. And thank you again. And I hope uh, you all take care. Bye.